Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, seventh plenary session of the Markets Under Critics course. Today we have Malte Dolt. He's an assistant professor in economics at Pomona College, California, and he teaches PP and economics uh, there. He previously was at New York University as a postdoctoral fellow, and he has an MA in philosophy and economics from the University of Beirut and a PhD in economics from the University of Freiburg. And his research lies at the intersection of economics, psychology, and ethics, although he works on a wide range of topics that connect the question of how situational framing and social environments shape decision-making processes, and specifically what constitutes individual agency when preferences and beliefs are context-dependent and change over time. So thank you, Malte. Please proceed with the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando, for having me. Um, I won't talk too much today about how the context shapes us, uh, but I will come back towards the end of my presentation to some of this, but I think um, a lot of people who are thinking about you know, the structure of state interventions, et cetera, should also take more seriously. So I will come back to that. But before that, I will talk about two things. Um, I will talk about um, order liberalism, which is a term that some of you might have heard, some of you associate something with it, but uh, you know, don't know the details. So I will sort of unpack that. And it's sort of a um, particular st strand within 20th century liberalism that um, gives the state a certain um, legitimacy and also looks at the structure of state interventions that might be conducive to flourishing markets. So um, we'll talk about that. And then also build the link to um, constitutional economics, uh, which is something particularly for those of you in the Anglo-American world might know more. And of course, um, James Buchanan as uh, the founding father of this whole um, strand in the literature of constitutional economics. And there's interesting links between auto liberalism and constitutional economics. And I will talk about those bridges. And I know you already heard uh, about some uh, of the uh, of the contents of public choice and of constitutional economics. And I will deepen it today uh, in my part, in the second part of my talk. This is the structure. So I will first talk a bit about the link between neoliberalism and autoliberalism, uh, then hone in on uh, what is called the Freiburg School, uh, which is sort of the most prominent account of um, autoliberal thinking. We'll talk a little bit about the theoretical background, but then also what are actually some of the policies uh, that they advocated for. Um, and then, as I said at the outset, we'll sort of like build this bridge between auto liberalism and, you know, the um, uh, constitutional economics of James Buchanan. Uh, and Buchanan is, of course, famous for having coined this term that one should do politics without romance, right? Um, if one applies sort of an economic logic to political processes, one takes off the romantic glasses in calling for state interventions in situations where it might not be justified. And, and then I will talk about one particular um, problem that uh, Buchanan and others saw in sort of political processes, uh, which is called majoritarian inefficiencies. Uh, and I will talk about that and see what are actually some of the remedies that constitutional economists proposed. And I, I think it's such a good example because it shows the structure of a lot of the um, normative implications that constitutional economists and public choice economists actually draw. And then towards the end, as I said, I will uh, build sort of like a, a little bridge to uh, some of the research that I, I've been done, uh, which is a, a, gent a gentle critique of some of the constitutional political economy stuff that we'll talk about today. Well, I largely think that it is a, a, a fascinating contribution. I think they should also take uh, insights from behavioral e uh, economics uh, more seriously. Now, there's a little warning. Um, auto liberalism being sort of a German uh, school of thought, a German tradition, there will be some German terms coming up. I partially also include them because they are, um, you know, exactly what you would uh, expect from German words along. Um, and uh, uh, I will, of course, give the English translation. Now, at the outset, uh, it's important to understand that, you know, in current political discourse, but also 20th century discourse, uh, auto liberals are sometimes, um, you know, called the German neoliberals. Uh, but I think it's important to understand what exactly that means. 
the um, and that's something many of you know. Of course, there was a uh, an international movement in the 1930s uh, that tried to revitalize, you know, um, liberal thought, uh, particularly in the aftermath of World War One, um, but also. Uh, in the aftermath of what happened sort of in the late 19th century. Uh, and people thought one needs to revitalize that. And the self-description of some of those uh, who thought uh, liberalism needs to be revitalized was neoliberals, right? That they would sort of be an update on the old, uh, you know, classical liberalism of the 19th century. And particularly influential was, of course, then the colloquy uh, of Walter Lippmann in the, in the mid-30s, um, uh, where you know, many uh, famous economists, but also uh, political theorists and philosophers at the time were present, and exactly asked that question, how can we revitalize li uh, liberalism? Particularly, uh, you know, the 30s were, of course, a tumultuous time where you had both on the far right and the far left sort of the two threats, the rise of Nazi Germany, but then also the rise of, of um, the Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, you know, liberalism had to situate itself. And of course, after the Second World War, that ultimately um, led then um, to the more Pelagan society. Now, Important, and I, I mentioned that in passing, but it's important to understand that um, this type of liberalism, uh, the predominant opinion at the time was that 19th century laissez-faire liberalism had failed. You know, it, it led to um, social struggles, it led to political um, instability, and a lot of these thinkers saw the source of the political instability in economic and failed economic reasoning. Uh, and this will become important later on also in my talk that sort of this connection between um, sound economic reasoning and political or societal stability. Now, you know, some of those failures um, that um, those uh, quote unquote neoliberals at the time uh, thought were at attributable to the 19th century laissez-faire liberalism was something like, you know, the poverty of the working class powerful corporations that emerged uh, that had quite a lot of uh, power. If they were not monopolies, it was a highly concentrated market often. And of course, there were also multiple uh, economic crises. Uh, if you think about the late 1920s, of course, which uh, was a huge depression. But before that, even there was sort of this constant struggle, um, not just political instability, but also within the markets. Uh, and, you know, the lessons that those um, neoliberals at the time uh, drew from these failures uh, were sort of the following. It was something like the state should take a more active role vis-a-vis -vis the economy. Um, and most importantly, the state should ensure competition. Um, uh, and the, the biggest evil sort of that um, thinkers at the time saw was sort of concentration of power in any form. And um, the, the German auto liberals, of course, also um, uh, after the Second World War in particular, were uh, particularly uh, you know, sensitive to this question of power concentrations in markets, uh, but also, of course, in, in politics. And you can see just with this you know, uh, very short description here that uh, this is not what typically you know, uh, critics of neoliberalism would think neoliberalism is all about, right? There's a clear uh, role and actually quite a, a strong role for the state. Um, and the question is now in today's talk, um, what that role is. So I will try to unpack that, what all the liberals thought that role is, and then also sort of um, ask what structure of state interventions can be justified from an economic point of view if one tries to apply some economic logic to the way the state is, is organized. Now, what is also important is, you know, this is not just a uh, German oddity at the time, uh, you know, this idea that one needs to revitalize uh, liberal thinking. There was an international movement, you know, of course, as many of you know, the, you know, Chicago School, those are the uh, proponents of the old Chicago School, Henry Simons um, and Frank Knight. Um, who uh, were similarly uh, concerned with the implications of economic actions for the political order in in a in, in a society, uh, and both of them, you know, um, had uh, something to say about you know how markets, uh, if left to them own, lead to 
concentrations, uh, inequalities, et cetera, that have political implications. Uh, there's a famous article, uh, an article that I always recommend to my students that Frank Knight uh, wrote in the early 20s called The Ethics of Competition, where Knight being, of course, a clear advocate of market allocations of, of all sorts of goods, clearly saw also one has to look critically at some of those um, you know, negative side effects and uh, ultimately um, try to soften them. Um, and there were others, you know, in London, um, here, Lionel Robbins as, as the figurehead, but, you know, who also made sure that, you know, Hayek uh, would come to, to LSE uh, and Hayek being sort of in the 30s in, in, um, in London and in, in England and having quite the influence there in this type of revitalization for uh, liberal thinking, of course, he has been very um, influential then for the foundation of the Montpellier Society. And, you know, here's a dot, dot, dot. Uh, it's not just Chicago or London. Uh, it's also Freiburg, a, a tiny town in the southwest of Germany. Uh, you see here actually two pictures. Uh, those pictures are taken from the early 1930s. The first picture is actually um, sort of the center um, of the town. Um, and um, the lower picture, lower left picture is the university. Um, uh, it's the university actually where I got my PhD. Uh, and this is uh, one of the old um, buildings where sort of philosophy and the humanities are housed. Now, the Freiburg School, what is that? Well, it was sort of like um, a group of scholars very much linked to this more international, um, you know, movement to revitalize liberal thought. Um, and those were scholars predominantly in law and economics. So there were economists, there were sort of legal scholars, um, and uh, they sort of like contributed both to um, an advancement of economic theory at the time in Germany, but also, and that's what they're really famous for, for uh, shaping also some of the policy discourse. And, um, you know, some might say, oh, they would have been long forgotten if it hadn't been for the influence on post-World War uh, II uh, economic order in, in Germany, um, you know, this idea of the social market economy. Yes, one needs strong markets, but also embedded in some sort of, um, you know, um, system of solidarity. Uh, and um, importantly, some of those thinkers were key figures and members of the advisory board of the Ministry of Economic Affairs after the Second World War. Um, and uh, the reason they could be so influential was actually also that they were quite um, active in the opposition to, uh, to you know, the Nazi rise and national socialism in, in uh, Germany. So they had a legitimate role to play then after the uh, World War. Um, and the two most well-known figures are Walter Eucken and Franz Böhm. Franz Böhm being um, uh, famous for his law and economic thinking, and Walter Eucken being um, the most important um, intellectual person here who contributed to a revitalization of economic thinking, uh, economic theorizing, uh, with clear uh, political implications. Uh, and for those of you who are interested uh, in sort of uh, resistance movements, it's it's quite interesting how they organized themselves, and they were links to some uh, figures uh, that were uh, active against uh, against Hitler and against the Nazis, um, which I think is quite interesting. And it's 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 important to know that that uh, those thinkers were not just uh, you know theorizing about liberalism; they were also sort of like walking their talk. Um, and other other liberals that I want to mention uh, are um, Willem Röpke and Alexander Rousseau, who are two thinkers uh, with a slightly different focus uh, from Eucken and Böhm. Eucken and Böhm were more interested in sort of the legal, economic, political implications, and Röpke and Rousseau were very influ uh, very influential for sort of like linking some of those auto liberal thoughts with more sociological um, analyses of society, in particular, the question of how does uh, an institutional arrangement actually shape the way we perceive each other as citizens? How can it help us incul uh, inculcate certain civic duties? Um, and they, uh, um, uh, particularly Röpke, uh, was uh, an advocate sort of of, of like, you know, rather like small scale communities where this kind of like Tocquevillian civic mindedness can be inculcated. 
Now, I said they were quite influential for a post-World War um, history. And in particular, they had an, um, uh, an important role to play uh, in the context of uh, the abolishment of price controls and you know, the liberalization of markets after the Second World War. And uh, even more, so the discussions about um, antitrust, um, and you will see that comes up uh, in a few slides again, antitrust being sort of like one of the main political tools to ensure competition on markets. Now, here I just brought to, uh, you know, uh, put you back, uh, you know, um, not a hundred years, but definitely uh, a few decades ago to what, what was the sentiment at the time? Um, of course, uh, there was uh, the huge uh, depression after the Second World War. But what happened then between 1948 and 1960 was sort of like what uh, you know historians call the German economic miracle, where there were uh, growth rates in terms of um, real GDP on average of 9.3%. I mean, if we compare that to today's growth rates, that's, uh, of, course, of course, quite astonishing. And on, on the right side, you see here the VW Beetle, um, uh, which was sort of like the, the most successful car at the time. Uh, and uh, that was celebrated at their factory that they sold the one millionth um, beetle in 1955. Uh, and you could see that those uh, economic, um, you know, the economic theorizing of the auto liberals had these uh, clear consequences in terms of the political institutional setup in Germany at the time. Now, what is this Freiburg School about? Apart from being linked to the city of Freiburg, which is quite a picturesque town in the southwest of, of Germany, um, the there was sort of like an, uh, an auto manifesto, and uh, it's quite interesting to see the time when it was published in, in the late 30s. Uh, and this is a quote from this manifesto uh, that reads as follows. The treatment of all practical, political, legal, and political economic questions must be keyed to the idea of the economic constitution. Now, for non-economists and even for lawyers, that's a bold statement, right? Uh, because you think about a lot of the political setups, the you know the legal arrangements, and many would say, well, there are good reasons not to uh, only adhere to economists uh, when we. Uh, try to design that. Now, that's also not what is meant here. What is meant here is that ultimately sound economic reasoning um, leads to good political um, and legal arrangements. Uh, in particular, this idea that, of course, uh, economists at the time have been thinking a lot about competition, uh, how to ensure competition and how to ensure that there are not these tendencies, both in markets and politics, to um, basically converge onto some form of power concentration. Um, and this thinking about competition was very key to the order liberals. Uh, and um, it, you know, you can have, of course, competition in the political realm uh, that um, ensures that there's not too much power uh, concentration, but in particular also in markets, um, because there is that tight link uh, and auto liberals called it the interdependence of orders between what happens in the economy and what happens in the political um, world. Now, the economic constitution is basically, uh, and here's all of the long, the first long German word, which is Wirtschaftsverfassung. Uh, so the economic constitution is, you know, the framework of rules, in particular sort of formal legal rules that govern the economic life of a community. Now, I mentioned before there is this sociological strand of auto liberalism. Auto liberals didn't just talk about, you know, oh, the importance of the legal framework. Um, uh, Rüstow and Röcke, the two uh, who were interested in the sociological strand of auto liberalism, um, also analyzed, you know, these informal norms that we need to have a stable liberal order, right? Um, you cannot just think about the, the formalistically about the legal framework if people are not on board and you do not have to buy in um, from the people. Um, now, the very obvious point I think nowadays, and particularly when we read in hindsight the work of James Buchanan and others, of course, economies are shaped by the economic constitution. You know, this idea of the rules of the game matter for what happens within the game. Um, but at the time, you know, this um, this link wasn't uh, in intellectual circles uh, emphasized um, that much. Uh, and, you know, 
what is what is important, uh, and this is um, something that I mentioned at the outset, that this is clearly not laissez-faire capitalism. Um, auto liberals thought that the beneficial effects of free market economies do not come about naturally. You know, and I was alluding to some of those quote unquote evils of 19th century liberalism. And auto liberals thought, you know, one needs to um, embed markets in a, uh, a clear um, legal framework to have these beneficial effects. And not just in terms of market efficiencies, but also in terms of democratic peace, you know, the social effects that you would have within societies. Now, functioning of markets depends on this appropriate institutional framework that I that I mentioned. Now, the question is, what is this institutional framework? Um, and I want to have, uh, before addressing that question, just a side note, of course, at the time, um, thinkers who were associated with the clock Walter Lippmann that I mentioned at the outset or the Mont Pelerin Society, they were not all speaking with one voice. In particular, Ludwig von Mises thought that the auto liberals were auto interventionists. And he he really thought that one needs to go down more a much more uh, minimal state route and, and, and constrain those state actions. Now, auto liberals themselves also thought so, uh, but it's a question sort of of degree here. Um, now, if we look at the content now of what is the state supposed to do, um, the important aspect of uh, you know this idea of thinking about market concentration and power was that we need competition to protect the political world from the interference of private actors, right? A typical sort of rent-seeking argument without calling it rent-seeking at the time. If you have too much economic power, it ultimately will translate into political power. And that's something that, you know, um, at the time, all the liberals thought um, need to be taken account of by designing the, uh, the right type of economic constitution. Now, there are two types of competition. Um, and this is sort of like, I think, an interesting theoretical contribution of the Freiburg School. On the one hand, you can have some type of performance-based competition, you know, the German word, Leistungswettbewerb, Leistung being a sort of the German word for, for performance and Wettbewerb for competition. And the idea is, if you think about a field track, 100 meters, okay, um, that is a performance competition. Whoever is best will win that game. Um, and it's sort of like by somebody exceeding in uh, that competition by trying to run faster, you incentivize that the other person trains more. The other person is also trying to win that competition, right? Uh, so that is a typical type of performance-based competition. But you can have a different form, which is a prevention competition. Uh, and here the German word is Behinderungswettbewerb. Uh, here... The uh, idea is not that you have this 100 meter, uh, you know, race, but what you have is a basically a boxing race. By you winning the competition, you box the other person down, right? You only win by beating the other side up. And of course, an economic, uh, translated in economic jargon, what that of course means is that you do not outcompete the other uh, side fan square, but you invest in destructive efforts to either through the political um, you know, game where you try to um, um, impose some sanctions, some regulations on the other side, or through direct sabotaging of the other side um, to win the, the competition. Or negative campaigning would be another, you know, um, if you think about advertisement. And you can see that clearly these two types of competition. And importantly, auto liberals thought that this prevention type of competition is inefficient uh, for a bunch of reasons, but particularly there's a whole bunch of investments going on in the uh, economy that are not productive. They're simply there to make, to destruct the other side uh, and to prevent the other side um, from winning. And you can think, you know, of many examples. You know, uh, cartels, trusts, etc., are the most obvious ones where you collude and you try to gain some favorable. Uh, treatment in the political uh, in the political game through rent seeking. Uh, so that's an, an argument that, of course, also then in modern times was picked up. You know, modern times uh, in the second half of the twentieth century by public choice scholars. Now, 
The question is, which acts of competitive behavior are permissible? Well, not the ones that are colluding uh, and where you build up a trust, um, but those that are ultimately beneficial to consumers. So there was this a, a standard that then also emerged in the second half of the 20th century as a standard of you know, antitrust law around the world, also in, in the US of consumer welfare, or what all the liberals call consumer sovereignty. That ultimately, when you try to judge the relative goodness of different economic regimes, what counts is the uh, sovereignty of the consumers, right? Ultimately, the question is, how good are interventions, you know, also interventions, let's say, in terms of antitrust law for consumers at the end of the day? That's the benchmark. And this goes obviously back to an older tradition in liberalism, all the way back to Adam Smith, who also thought, ultimately, when you want to judge the goodness of a, uh, an economic regime of markets, then you have to see in how far do they, um, you know, are they beneficial to consumer preferences? Well, this sounds all well and good. The question is now, what are the constraints on those state actions, right? Um, uh, and potentially, if you stop here, you could think of all sorts of ad hoc interventions into markets that could be justified based on this idea of antitrust pro-competitive um, behavior. And um, all I can say, you know, the response is actually not whether you want to have more or less activity. The question, uh, you know, if you ask that, or how much state should we have, that misses the point. Ultimately, it's not a quantitative question, but a qualitative one. Um, and here, um, you know, Oiken and others thought the state should influence the outcome of markets, not directly, you know, having in mind a certain, let's say, distributional goal, um, but by improving the rules framework in which markets operate. And of course, there are sort of like uh, obvious arguments why you want to um, address the rules and not the economic uh, uh, discrete choices of individuals uh, and, and companies uh, for knowledge and incentive arguments, right? You, If, if you want to have discrete interventions, uh, you might not know all the side effects. You might not have the knowledge on the ground to do this um, effectively, but there are also intricate incentive effects, when you start intervening, um, you know, in, in situation A, you might also need to do similar in situation B, C, you name it. And, and that sort of creates these sort of um, um, ripple effect, uh, where then actors are also asking too much of the state. So there's also an incentive effect not to intervene in discrete economic processes. And, and a, a differentiation that you will always find sort of in the literature on auto liberalism is, is the one between, on the one hand, auto liberal policy called Ordnungspolitik and interventionist policy, uh, policy which is called pro, uh, Prozesspolitik. And you can see the interventionist policy would be you try to intervene in economic processes themselves and say, oh, I as a state know how to improve that. And auto liberals thought that's wrong because there are all these knowledge and incentive uh, problems. But on the other hand, there is, of course, the idea that one could have to design the right rules framework the, on the constitutional level, which order liberals called Ordnungspolitik. Now, the question is, what is the you know, ideal constitution? Uh, and I deliberately chose the word ideal here because um, there is an intellectual history that the auto liberals tap into, which is German idealism all the way back to Immanuel Kant and other thinkers, that we're really thinking about these uh, um, um, you know, constitutional reforms, not just in an economic way, but also very influenced by these older philosophical traditions. Um, and what is also interesting here that um, those Auto liberals at the time, in particular Eucken here, uh, were always thinking about economics not purely on economic terms, in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of ethics. Uh, and the catchphrase, Eucken's catchphrase, was that you need a constitution that is both functioning and humane. And functioning meaning, you know, that secures some sort of efficiency, uh, you know, opti optimal provision of consumer goods, etc. You know, consumer sovereignty being respected, but then also humane. Uh, which means that it sort of brings out the best in us. You know, it ensures the freedom of person and also human flourishing. And I put here the little um, uh, a little reference to a recently published book uh, by Kenneth Dyson uh, called "Conservative Liberalism: Order Liberalism and the State." And it, it it's I think a good book uh, because it shows what are those deeper intellectual undercurrents 
particularly sort of in the philosophical literature of 18th and 19th century within Germany that influenced the thinking of the auto liberals, particularly uh, in the in the ethical domain. And you can see actually, for those of you are interested in this sort of intellectual history, um, you know, references to, to Goethe, for example, a famous um, German um, uh, poet um, and, and other thinkers uh, who were, um, you, you know, clearly concerned with sort of a liberation, not just in economic terms, but also sort of the German type of enlightenment movement that was at the core. And it's sort of like not surprising, of course, if you think about Scottish enlightenment um, um, at the time in 18th, 19th century, that we're also thinking, right, um, not just in economic terms, but also what does actually a liberal order do in terms of um, individual self-realization and bringing, as I said, the best out in humans. Um, now, Eucken proposed a very specific competitive order. You know, we talked a lot about formal structure now, but what is uh, now the content of um, this competitive order? And, and I won't go through all the details of his principles, but to give you a flavor, Eucken differentiated between constitutive and regulative principles. Now, the constitutive um, principles are... In the middle, so you see these, um, you know, freedom to contract, open markets, uh, primacy of monetary and fiscal stability, private property rights, liability, uh, and consistency in economic uh, policy. And then you had these regulative principles, um, which basically were the principles uh, that uh, would say what what policies should we have. Now, um, you can clearly see that, you know, if we start at the outside at, at the squared boxes, antitrust policy, I already mentioned that, that, you know, all the liberals were particularly concerned with power concentrations of markets and the right type of antitrust policy could ensure that we do not have those concentrations. Um, but then also, you know, this is very much in line with, you know, standard welfare economics then that emerged in the second half of the um, 20th century, that, you know, the provision of public goods and the correction of negative externalities is important because both of those things could not be done in markets, you know, uh, public goods would be underprovided and external effects would be taking, uh, a, you know, would not be priced in in uh, regular market prices. And then, you know, what's also interesting is the upper right one, you know, redistributive policies. All the liberals thought, particularly also, um, you know, uh, having experienced uh, the horrors of the Second World War, thought some sort of redistribution um, progressive taxation, et cetera, would be important to ensure that one doesn't just have uh, the prevention of power concentration on top, right? That's what antitrust policy would ensure, but also at the bottom sort of of um, the income distribution that one makes sure that people are enabled to participate in the market game, right? That was the idea. Um, and, you know, you can see at the very center of this, you know, economic constitution, the idea that ultimately the allocative mechanism that we have for allocating goods and services are flexible prices, you know, um, that are prices that are not defined by state intervention, interventions, prices emerge in market processes, and it's the state who only ensures the legal framework by, for example, ensuring freedom of contract, by ensuring the idea of liability, um, which means if you have a certain, um, you take a certain economic action, that ultimately you also have to bear the consequences of those actions if things don't turn out right, right? And of course, liability would be the idea that you build in incentives that people actually, um, you know, are not too risky, for example, in their economic endeavors. Respecting private property is obviously an obvious one. Uh, only if you respect private property, people will be incentivized in, in a temporal sense to invest in economic activities. And this idea of the primacy of monetary and fiscal stability, that was partially also, you know, coming out of the experience, both of the Weimar Republic, you know, what happened after, right after the Second World, uh, First World War, which was quite unstable. Um, 
But then also sort of the vision for the post-World War II order where one said we need that to prevent those hyperinflations that happened uh, all around the world, but particularly in Germany in the late 20s um, that then led to this um, political instability. And consistency in economic policy is the idea that you ultimately do not want to have too much discrete, flexible very pragmatic interventions, because ultimately that would be also disruptive to those economic processes that, um, you know, uh, all the liberals would advocate for. And then finally, you know, open market simply means you have to really make sure uh, that you always enable the new entry of entrepreneurs into markets that put economic pressure on those who are already on those markets. Now, this sounds all good, and obviously, in hindsight, very much in line with what made it into the textbooks uh, around the world when we read any chapter on you know, wealthy economics in the 20th century. But there seems to be a miracle occurring uh, along the way here, uh, and that is, how are these principles actually derived? How are they justified? How are they justified in the liberal sense, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that's a very legitimate critique of order liberals. Order liberals had still sort of a leftover, what you could call aristocratic liberalism, where the enlightened elite comes up with the right principles that are then, quote unquote, imposed on the masses. Uh, and, you know, Eugen and others didn't really think about carefully how could those principles of an economic constitution how could they actually be democratically justified? And the person who really thought a lot about that uh, was uh, Victor Wanberg, who um, modernized order liberalism and emphasized similarities to constitutional economics, and particularly the idea that ultimately you need some sort of social contract account to justify those principles of the economic constitution. It cannot be an economic elite that just comes up with that. And you can see actually empirical examples of 20th century um, are probably leading some force to this argument that when you just have economists thinking, you know, very carefully, what would make sense, uh, you know, and these might be sound principles, but if you do not have the democratic buy-in of the affected citizens, ultimately, you, of course, will not have a stable liberal order. And Eugen said, you know, um, that basically what uh, order liberals did wrong is they thought a lot about consumer sovereignty, uh, how can you ensure that consumer preferences are satisfied and respected on markets? But they didn't really think carefully enough about how to ensure citizen sovereignty, that citizens are actually heard in political processes, including processes that lead to some sort of um, economic constitution. And of course, you can see here um, interesting links to James Buchanan. In fact, uh, you know, Victor Monberg was uh, at George Mason when uh, Buchanan uh, was at George Mason. Buchanan was very pivotal in actually bringing Monberg there as a professor. Uh, and then later on, Monberg uh, went to Freiburg and became the director of the Eugen Institute, which is the predominant order liberal institute to this day um, that tries to sort of like preserve and also develop the heritage of those order liberals in the 1930s and 40s. Now, what are the links between order liberalism and constitutional economics? So between sort of, let's say, Eucken's world and Buchanan's world. Um, now, it's important, you know, if we do intellectual history to understand that the order liberals are not a literal predecessor of constitutional economics, but there are strong similarities. Why are they not literal? Well, Buchanan didn't read much Eucken, for example. I mean, but people read similar thinkers um, and of course, we're part of a similar movement. Um, and you, I think, heard already on, on Tuesday that, of course, Buchanan was very much influenced by Knut Wicksell uh, in his type of thinking about constitutional order. Um, but it's um, important that both, you know, the, the order liberals and the, the constitutional economists uh, that followed uh, in Buchanan's um, um, footsteps, they were both interested in the type of rules that you come up with that ultimately affect economic and political outcomes. Uh, and both would say, you know, of course, those rules are important um, and ultimately are a, a matter of a political choice. You know, it's not 
just um, you know, if you think uh, uh, with another important uh, thinker in this movement, Hayek, Hayek was much more careful in, in, in deliberately designing rules of the game. Buchanan and other liberals were much more optimistic uh, in saying it needs to be a deliberate political choice. And here's a quote uh, from uh, you know the famous book by Buchanan and, and, and Tullock, The Calculus of Consent. What they say here is we shall mean by this term constitution, a set of rules that is agreed upon in advance and within, within which subsequent action will be conducted. So the important thing is it is a set of rules, a deliberate set of rules that's agreed upon by the affected citizens. Now, differences between these two schools of thought, you know, auto liberalisms and um, people uh, in, in Buchanan's um, camp is that members of the Freiburg School were very reluctant to extend the analysis to political processes. That's partially due that uh, to the fact that Walter Eucken actually passed away quite early, uh, quite young, um, in, in in the early fifties, and they couldn't extend sort of their thinking to um, a, a more fine grained analysis of political processes. But the very important um, aspect is that Buchanan said, of course, ultimately, uh, the legit, uh, legitimacy of social arrangements, political arrangements, can only uh, derive from ultimately the voluntary consent of citizens, what Buchanan called normative individualism. And that was, uh, at best, very implicit only in the Freiburg School. The Freiburg School, as I said, um, earlier was uh, very much this idea that is sort of this enlightened economic elite that comes off with a, a, a constitutional framework that ensures a liberal order. Uh, but you can see it's a very elite driven uh, project that Buchanan being quite an anti-elitist, if you uh, know a bit about his uh, his biography, um, is, uh, you know, was clearly sort of more sensitive towards than um people in the Freiburg School. Now here's Buchanan uh, in his office. Uh, the picture is actually taken uh, before he got the Nobel Prize. He got the Nobel Prize in 1986. This is taken in 1985. And, you know, Buchanan is famous for this, def def for many things, but also for this def differentiation between choices within constraints and choices among constraints, right? So standard economics is, of course, all about, you know, how... Uh, do uh, rational individuals make um, choices given the constraints that they face, you know, the relative prices, et cetera, and, you know, this idea of uh, then, you know, maximizing utility given constraints, et cetera, is very much the logic of 20th century microeconomics. But Buchanan said, you know, that, of course, that's sort of very uh, peculiar because individuals do not just make choices within constraints, but they also think carefully about the constraints that they actually face, right? Uh, and particularly those, um, you know, constraints that they're facing through the political, legal, um, um, institutional order. Um, and also when we do not just think about the political legal orders, individuals on a uh, day-to-day basis are thinking about constraining themselves all the time, right? You have uh, rationality, not just applied to, choices within constraints, but also sort of constraints that you will impose on your future self. And Ulysses here in the Sirens is the best example, right? Ulysses who tied himself to the mast to not fall prey to the beautiful singing of the Sirens. And the individuals here, of course, we do this all the time, right? We have alarm clocks. We use uh, our friends to hold us accountable. We try to put money into the savings account that we do not touch, etc. There's this idea that uh, because we are aware of our fallibilities, constraints are important. And exactly that same type of thinking, um, Buchanan thought, can be applied to societal issues, political issues, that because of human fallibility uh, and because of, of sort of the logic of the political game, we need to also put those constraints on the political uh, game, and that's very much in our rational self-interest, right? Um, and Buchanan here says in this quote, as part of an exchange in which the restrictions on their own actions are sacrificed in return for the benefits that are anticipated from the reciprocally extended restrictions on the actions of others. Now, that's a beautiful quote uh, to just uh, put this in lay layman's um, terms is, of course, if you want the benefits of mutual transactions in markets, we might need to put constraints on ourselves onto certain actions that we as individuals don't do. Uh, we do not deceive each other, for example, but also when it comes to um, 
the uh, allowable actions of political actors, we might need to put constraints on it. And Buchanan called that politics without romance. The idea that both in markets and in the political game, we are um, you know, self-interested, altruistic, but we are also fallible. Um, um, and uh, applying this uh, would then mean to apply the logic of economic thinking to the way uh, you know, typically, um, uh, the political scientists only thought about, you know, namely the design of political institutions and the three core principles sort of of PCT, public choice theory, uh, methodological individualism, the homo economicus and politics as exchange. Politics as exchange means by coming together in some sort of uh, social contract, we can ensure that the political, um, uh, the design of the political rules is mutually beneficial. Homo economicus is the idea that ultimately we assume self-interest in uh, both the markets and when we design political institutions. Why? Because you do not want to be naive in the way you design institutions, because if you do not assume self-interest, those actors who are self-interest interested will exploit the political rules and it's methodologically individualistic why because ultimately um, we need to understand the incentives that operate on the actors within those games um, and both in the market and in the political world now the idea to have rules that bind political actors is that we put incentives the right type of incentives on those actors in governments. Um, and the question is why? I was alluding to fallibility. I was alluding to self-interest. But of course, there is sort of a concrete, uh, and this is sort of the example that I want to discuss now, a concrete um, problem in democratic decision-making that sometimes coined a majoritarian inefficiencies. Uh, and a concrete example of majoritarian inefficiency, inefficiencies is, you know, just when you look at government spending as a share of GDP over time, it just goes in one direction. And the question is, why does it go in one direction? Why are bureaucracies growing larger? Why is there more spending? And, um, you know, doing politics without romance tries to understand the logic here, but then also what could be potential intervention Interventions and interventions on the rules basis that prevent these type of dynamics unfolding in the political world. Now, majoritarian inefficiencies uh, is basically the idea that when you have these homo, you know, economic or the homo economicus model of political actors, well, they will exploit others uh, for their own benefits rather than always thinking about mutually beneficial exchanges. Um, and, you know, of course, the term that um, we have now in modern, um, uh, you know, economic thinking for that is that groups are always seeking rents, right? So group specific payoffs that do not necessarily contribute to the overall well functioning properties of markets um, and the political game. And it's again, this, uh, you know, differentiation that I was alluding earlier type, that it's very much a struggle type rent seeking competition and not a record type competition that's mutually beneficial. Um, and a concrete example for uh, the type of, um, uh, you know, rent seeking contest would be a, z a zero sum game where you have basically the majority using their power to pass legislation with uh, benefiting only them, uh, but makes everybody else pay. Um, and there is sort of an example of that in, in, in Buchanan and Tullock, and it, it pops up uh, in Calculus of Consent, but also in the later writings of Buchanan, uh, uh, of this negative sum game that might unfold if we do not put constraints on the type of majoritarian decisions we have. Here's the example. Um, and again, this is a stylized example, but it shows a more general point. Assume there's a town of a thousand voters who decide on a series of expenses, uh, expenditures. And in this town, you have different um, consti constituents, different um, groups. Uh, they're all equally sized, you know, 200 people in each group. Uh, but each of these groups has uh, a different priority, what they actually want in the town. Um, and all share sort of like a willingness to pay, meaning how much am I willing to pay for my uh, project? what is sort of my willingness overall to contribute taxation to the public goods, we assume that willingness to pay is $600 for each of um, um, the voters. Now, assume there are these five uh, groups. One is the young families. You know, young families typically want primary school. That is their pet projects. You have older, wealthier um, um, 
an older wealthier group they want the golf course of course you know that's what they need for a good life you have the yuppies uh they want you know a, a vibrant inner city close off the main street and then make it beautiful pave it with cobblestones you have those with teenage children, you know, are particularly interested. How can you uh, make sure that those teenage children are taken care of? And you have the outlying residents um, that want sort of like, you know, those roads um, paved that are side roads that are not uh, in the inner part of town. Now, um, let's assume that the young families make a proposal. But of course, what they need, if they need the majority, they need the support of two other groups. Um, and what they do is they get the buy-in from the older wealthier and the yuppies by saying listen um if you help me with getting the primary schools i will vote for your projects the golf course and closing off main street um uh, and um what we have is sort of like a willingness to pay um what we're assuming here that both the older wealthier and the yuppies are willing to say okay we contribute 200 bucks to your project um and of course if you think about this coalition of vote trading and you have uh, this coalition of three uh, parties involved, you have to assume each one of them has to contribute 200 to each project. So you stay within your willingness to pay of 600 bucks overall in each in each group. Now, what happens, and I won't go uh, through the details here, but just allude to the uh, to the, the mechanism, you have exactly this type of vote trading in several rounds and what happens is that ultimately when you have these vote trading dynamics you basically um, end up with a um, total tax revenue that is uh, 200k and why is that you have you know basically 200 bucks times a thousand times the individuals involved um, um, but what you have is sort of the, the private willingness to pay in each group would be basically 600 bucks uh, times the 200 people in a group, which would only be 120K. What that means is that each group, particularly the group that starts out, out with things, oh, I'm getting 80,000 um, 80, here for free. Um, but of course, what happens is if you have that dynamic unfolding in several rounds, you ultimately end up with taxes that are higher than the willingness to pay of each individual group. Uh, so the tax is ultimately a thousand that is higher than 600 because you have in each round the majority pushing a certain tax burden on the minority. And of course, the idea here is that when you have these particular favors that you do that do not apply generally to the group, what you have then is you have inefficiencies coming out of this type of rent seeking um, and vote trading. And ultimately each party is worse off in this dynamic um, than when they would provide the good privately. Right? Privately they have a willingness to pay of 600, but ultimately they need to pay taxes in this dynamic system of taxation unfolding that leads to negative sum game. Ultimately everybody's worse off. Now, the, the response that constitutional economists have here is twofold. One is that you might, you could say, we might need more than a simple majority, right? Uh, we might need more than a simple majority. Um, but the second intervent, you know, and that prevents that we can push sort of our tax burden onto this dissenting minority. Uh, but the second one is we also constrain the type of policies that we would allow any majority coalition imposing on the other side. And the solution here is what Buchanan called the policies need to pass a test of generality. In the interest of time, I won't deal with uh, you know the type of uh, logic that Buchanan and Taluk uh, apply to the choice of voting rules, but concentrate on this idea of generality. Now, here is you know the problem that we have in these majoritarian inefficiencies is that we have these winning coalitions that can imp uh, impose costs on the dissenting minority. Um, and uh, the result emerges because there are these different treatments, right? There's sort of particular people benefiting from a certain policy and we do not equally benefit from those policies. Now, a potential solution is that we need something like a principle of generality when it comes to both taxation but also when it comes to uh, how we um, spend and what type of policies um, we would advocate for. And flat taxes uh, would be one example, but a uniform regulation of all industries would be another example. 
Now, this type of thinking is both, it's summarized in a nice article here on the left side, written by Buchanan, but also in the book that he co-wrote with uh, Roger Congleton. And particularly those second, uh, the second part uh, is alluding to how can you take care of those majoritarian inefficiencies that I was just describing. And what is important is that typically when you have majoritarian inefficiencies, what you have, you have a prisoner's dilemma game that ultimately leads to um, a worse outcomes because we have ultimately a zero sum game uh, that leads to this mutually um, um, effective strategies over time, at least. And what we need to do is we need to constrain the policies that we allow uh, that ultimately try to get rid of the off diagonals. This idea that we in each and every round when we talk about taxation and uh, expenditure, that we have sort of these unilaterally benefiting um, uh, benefits from these winning coalitions. We need to rule that out. We need to get rid of these off diagonals. And the principle of generality is supposed to do that. It's supposed to say only those policies that benefit us all and those type of taxations that have some baked in principle of generality will prevent those particular interests to dominate in these winning coalitions. And in doing so, we get rid of those majoritarian inefficiencies. And I wanna just close off with a few examples uh, that you know uh, would be uh, in the realm of law. When you have a general law, it would be equal treatment of all people compared to special treatment of groups uh, and, and persons. Taxations, you know, broad-based taxes, uniform tax rates, the exempt of uh, the absence of exemption, et cetera, that will prevent this type of negative dynamic unfolding. Uh, but you could also, when you think about expenditures, you want something where you do not have all these local um, uh, public goods defined centrally, uh, but you want to have some sort of fiscal federalism. And also when you have the provision of consumption goods that are equally beneficial, of course, to all. And when you, and when you regulate the structure uh, that you want to have is the type of regulation that you impose on others, you uh, apply uh, to all and you have a subsidy for all industry, let's say, and not just for particular industries, because whenever you open up the particular route, you will open it up to rent seeking and you will open it up to, in the long run, some sort of zero sum um, dynamic unfolding. In the interest of time, I am brief here. So my own work says I really like uh, what the auto liberals do, but I think they underestimate the effect of institutions on individuals often on the on, on moral learning. And particularly when you only think about how to uh, incentivize political action and, and, and incentivize sort of like uh, have this idea of self-interest that you assume both uh, for politicians, but also for individuals, you might over emphasize the importance of um, negative um, um, uh, incentives. And in doing so, you might, might crowd out some sort of civic mindedness. So for those of you who are interested in that, I'm happy to talk a bit more in the Q&A. Uh, this is sort of where, where my personal work is at uh, the intersection of this thinking about orders, but then also what uh, has behavioral economics to contribute, um, you know, and particularly the question, how does the institutional environment and our social relationships uh, structure some sort of moral, moral learning? I want to close off with a few recommendations. Here is a book that I co-edited um, with Tim Krieger, uh, but there's also an Oxford handbook on auto liberalism, which I think is, is quite good. There are a bunch of outlets, you know, that um, um, both for constitutional economics and for auto liberal uh, thinking and journals that uh, I recommend. And um, last but not least, this Walter Eugen Institute uh, that I mentioned at the outset and its director Lars Feld are very active. They're very, um, 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 you know, many, um, um, resources, but also events that they do, and particularly also an event that we have for young scholars this summer um, on auto liberalism, the next generation. This is the second workshop we had on a couple of years ago. Uh, so I encourage you to either come by this time around or in the future. I think it's a, a vibrant community that really thinks about, um, you know, the, uh, the logic of liberalism applied to, uh, you know, political rules that then affect economic outcomes. That's it. I appreciate you, and I'm looking forward to potential questions. Hi, thank you, Malte. We have a couple of questions. Uh, let's start with the, I think, history of economic thought questions. It's about the Freiburg School specifically. Was there something special about Freiburg as a city or as a university compared to other places in Germany that made these ideas uh, fructiferous there, or was just luck? Um, 
Excellent question. Uh, I can only hypothesize here. Um, I, of course, you have sort of an initial element of luck of personalities being involved, being people at the right, you know, right people at the right time that then are, you know, it's mutually stimulating. Um, and I think that played a role uh, that Eugen and Boom, where they are interested in similar uh, questions that then had sort of a critical mass to influence other people. But of course, what happens then when you have this uh, initial moment of luck of people being in a similar place, you can be strategic about who do you bring to that place, right? Now, what is interesting, the 1930s, we're not a beacon of liberalism anywhere in Germany, and also particularly actually in Freiburg. Um, and some of you might know that Martin Heidegger, a very famous German philosopher who influenced you know, French existentialism and others, he became the, the, um, the, the president of the university. Um, and he actually um, threw out a lot of like Jewish scholars. He had a very much like pro-national socialist cultural agenda that was anything uh, you know, was nothing like, you know, what the auto liberals had in mind. So there wasn't like sort of this uh, beacon of uh, local liberalism within this soup of Nazi Germany. It affected the university and the university, you know, I, I got my PhD there. Um, it's not a university, historically speaking, that was particularly strong in, in, in liberal thinking. Um, now, what happened, and I, I um, one could talk much more about that, what happened after the Second World War, particularly then uh, in the 60s, the university made sure that Friedrich Hayek would come to Freiburg. Um, and Hayek, having at that time being very successful, but having also been perceived as a natural follow-up to Eukon. Eukon had passed, as I said, in the 50s, who could revitalize some of those thinkings about orders, about liberalism. And again, then, this wasn't something that happened by chance, but very much was a deliberate um, case that was built on those early moments of luck that the right people were at the right place. A follow-up question on history is, do you think German history influenced the ordo liberal position on trade, especially because firms, cartels, and workers' unions are more common in Germanic-speaking world compared to the English-speaking one? Yeah, so two things uh, one could say about that. One is um, a yes and then a, a but. Um, so the yes is, the idea that um, you get some sort of um, you know restriction on what type of mergers you would approve, um, the German sort of um, you know antitrust system has been more active based on those intellectual um, undercurrents that we were talking about. So there was a clear influence, of course, of the German auto liberals, and then also the idea of consumer protection, right, is something that if you're in the Anglo-American world, um, you're often quite surprised how active the state is in terms of consumer protection. And I'm not just talking now about consumer protection when it comes to healthcare or something like that, but uh, all the way down to, um, you know, the way, you know, information is provided to consumers, uh, the way, you know, when we talk about uh, regulation of the digital world nowadays, you know, has much, has been much more active and the types of constraints that have been imposed on the business side um, have been higher than in the Anglo-American world, partially due to this intellectual tradition that the state can help and protect consumers. And here's the but. The but is that what happened also in the intellectual history of the 20th century is that the order liberals after Eugen had passed, there was a, a you know a new generation, the, the second and third wave of order liberals, they were particularly concerned not so much with consumer protection, but particularly on the one hand antitrust, but even more so, they were concerned with what I called protest politics, this interventionist type of policies that the state would do. So a lot of intellectual energy and ink at the time had been spilled on how can those interventionist, you know, you could also say uh, neo-Keynesian interventions, you know, in the 70s and 80s prevented, uh, be prevented. And so there is like not just, you know, what you would call now in modern terms, a typical sort of, uh, you know, the state is there to protect the consumers, but 
predominantly at the time, actually, uh, a lot of um, auto liberals were more concerned with state interventions than actually advocating for state interventions. And mm -hmm. that could have been then seen in the 70s and 80s, um, uh, but also all the way into the 90s. So one has to differentiate a bit. Um, and uh, I would say only the generation uh, in the last maybe 20 years or so uh, has been, again, more concerned with these, uh, you know, clearly these concerns of also consumer protection, um, et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah. But this this idea um, in the question, uh, and I keep this this part brief, that workers have a voice in the way, you know, corporate governance is structured is very much um, the logic that all the liberals both want to see on the state level right, to get the buy-in of the citizens, but also on the corporate level that you want to get the buy-in of the, of the affected, uh, of the affected workers. Um, um, but again, many auto liberals in the seventies and eighties did not write much about, you know, this core determination of corporate governance and including workers' rights. But I think it's, it's, it, the spirit is actually very auto liberal. Another question regarding the order liberal position. Uh, what was the order liberal position on international policies and foreign relations? So so far, it seems like it looks as a state as just a close close country. But do you think what what is the international trade position of order liberals? And do you think that they were predecessors of the European Union in some sense? Yeah. So um, what you see is um, that this idea of having um, some sort of collaboration, uh, an institutional framework on the on the European level, was very much uh, baked into the thinking, particularly of the all, all early order liberals. Uh, and the idea was, of course, that if you have the right type of economic constitution on a supranational framework, you prevent those nasty. Um, competitions on the country level where you sort of have dynamics unfolding that are mutually destructive and ultimately might even lead to some sort of political uh, you know, implications. And of course, what you saw is uh, not just economic competition countries competing each other uh, along often protectionist dimensions, but also that you had sort of war. <laughs> so you had this clear concern of all the liberals with political struggle, but also this idea of protectionist nationalist um, legislations. And the hope was by having some sort of economic constitution for Europe, you get those liberal forces unfolding on a European level. So uh, yes, all the liberals in that sense were predecessors of, um, you know, you could say the European Union. The caveat here again is a lot of the auto liberals of the 70s and 80s and into the 90s then were quite critical of the way the European Union unfolded being sort of much more oriented to some sort of interventionist framework that tries to really intervene in certain type of market processes and not just allowing sort of for this um, rules-based um, uh, framework. Um, if you think of, for example, of the of uh, the interventions of the European Central Bank, right? Now, what happened, of course, uh, after the crisis in 2007 and 8 economic recession all over Europe, social unrest, etc. The typical order liberal voice was quite cautious when it came to bailing out countries. Uh, why? This old idea of liability, you know, you want a sound economic order that ultimately, if you screw it, quote unquote, you should also um, take care of, of your consequences. And, uh, and, and that's why, uh, yes, order liberals are very much, you know, pro and internationalist economic regime, but against sort of like this more Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American, very pragmatic interpretation of international rules. Now, that's why, uh, you know, Paul Krugman um, um, sort of like criticized the auto liberals for having sort of this very particular German tradition and, you know, putting an iron cage around political, um, uh, you know, the pro potential for political interventions. So yes, pro-international order, but against sort of this very active, discrete, practical orientation um, that the European Union, uh, particularly the, the ECB took um, than in, in, in the last 20 years or so. And one last question. Well, they, they are two, but they are related. The, the first one is, has ordo liberalism as a scholarly project transformed fully into constitutional political economy? And the second question, in your presentation, you focus very much on what constitutional economics added 
to order liberalism. Is there something that order liberalism added to constitutional economics? Yeah, so that's that's a wonderful um, question. So the the direction of influence is more that you know you had the order liberalism being historically before the uh, the constitutional political movement, uh, political econ movement, but they sort of like developed separately, having similar grandfathers that influenced them, <laughs> but then separately, and then the influence was stronger from constitutional economics onto order liberal thinking. Now, I think what I see as a contribution of order liberal thinking to the constitutional economic thinking is that actually the sociological strand within order liberalism, thinking about the reflexivity of institutional orders onto the citizens, and particularly the type how citizens perceive each other, uh, what type of values are inculcated in citizens, et cetera. That was very much part of, um, you know, order liberal thinking, a very nuanced thinking about how interdependence of orders work, you know, how the, the legal and economic actually affect the civic, et cetera. I think that's something that Buchanan and others didn't really, um, uh, we're not that interested in, and it's something that they are, uh, you know, all, often, you know, also criticized for. And of course, Eleanor Ostrom, and Vincent Ostrom being sort of like in, uh, on the U.S. side, people who emphasized actually exactly those nuances that then influenced, of course, people that worked around Buchanan. But the influence was not via the order liberals, but mm. via the Ostroms. Um, and I think um, that there is sort of this potential broader discourse that one could have that now how does you know the sociological strand in order liberalism go beyond what the Ostroms had to say? Um, and that's, I think, very much... An interesting research question. Well, thank you, Malte, for the fascinating presentation. Thank you, everybody. So let's remind everyone that we will finish our sessions next week. So thank you. And I, I appreciate you. And uh, yeah, hope to see you at some point in Philly. Yeah. <laughs>